Hello, my name is Daniel Green. I'm a pediatric orthopedic surgeon in New York, and this next talk uh, reviews my approach to treating young athletes with ACL injuries uh, in our practice in New York. This technique uh, was recently uh, highlighted in a uh, JBJS uh, article in March of 2013, and there's also a nice uh, technique guide that also uh, describes the technique by the uh, company Arthrex. So the principles of an all inside, uh, or let's say an all epiphyseal ACL reconstruction are really, um, were first introduced by Dr. Anderson. And then you can see on the drawing on the left where he puts a new ACL graft with, in a horizontal epiphyseal socket in the distal femur and then makes a small tunnel through the epiphysis of the tibia. And in, an, in, a, and in his initial technique, he uh, tensioned and tightened the graft over a post in the metaphysis of the proximal tibia. Whereas you can see the, the uh, technique we'll talk about today is an all inside, all epiphyseal socket technique where the entire graft is placed within the epiphysis, both on the femur and the tibia uh, eliminating any fixation points um, across the growth plate. We use uh, help. We use the hand for bone age measures, uh, as we discussed previously. The HSS shorthand bone age is is very uh, useful in this young age group to determine uh, the amount of growth remaining. Our general approach is for the older children who, with open growth plates, is to use a uh, transficeal hamstring ACL technique as you see on the left. If we start seeing closure of the proximal tibia, we'll, we'll use a bone tendon bone patellagraft. With two or three years of growth remaining, we'll often cross the proximal tibia growth plate, but spare the distal femoral growth plate uh, as you see in the second picture from the left. And the third picture from the left is our treatment of choice for the kids with three to six years of growth remaining. On the far right is the modified Macintosh made uh, famous by uh, Dr. McKaylee and Coker. And we um, use this technique for the very young children and for the children uh, with uh, less than 70 pounds of weight. So this technique is an all inside, all epiphyseal technique. They're sockets, they're not tunnels. We maintain the cortical bridge on both the femoral and tibial side. It requires, uh, um, as we'll, we'll see in a few minutes, some um, graft passing and suture management techniques. These are buttons that have self-tightening loops on them. The, the tightrope is used on the femur, and a similar device, the uh, tightrope ABS button, is uh, used on the uh, tibia. Again, no fixation across the growth plates. This allows us to place our graft in the knee um, anatomically at the ACL footprint. footprint. It avoids lateral arthrotomy. It helps avoid uh, the potential for growth disturbance and uh, again does not cross the growth plate. We use a longitudinal incision along the anterior medial aspect of the knee to harvest our hamstring tendons. Um, we place arthroscopic portals within the knee to facilitate um, suture uh, passing and management and graft mat passing. Um, here, when we're using our femoral guide, you can see my thumb is on the posterior lateral um, condyle of the knee, and so we'll use the X-ray for our anterior land for our anterior position, um, but for the anterior posterior position, uh, we use the tactile sense of feeling what the femoral condyle is. Here we are, we harvest the uh, hamstring with a direct open procedure. The graft is then taken to the back table and uh, prepared with uh, usually in a 55 to 60 millimeters in length. And because the quad tendon is, because the tendon is often quadded, we get a relatively good thick tendon, typically over nine millimeters in diameter. We mark the sutures at 20 millimeters so that when we're doing arthroscopy within the knee, we know that we have at least 20 millimeters of graft within our sockets. Here's a diagram of that. We want to get at least 20 millimeters of graft in each one of our sockets. Uh, again, we're using the arthroscopic portals, relatively small knees, 
Uh, we've helped design these guides uh, with the company of uh, Arthrex to allow some of the steeper angles that are not typically used in adult ACL reconstruction. We use C-arm um, to we use arthroscopy to pick our insertion point within the knee and C-arm to help uh, judge our relationship with the distal femoral and proximal tibia growth plates. This is a unique step guide that we actually hammer through the cortex and then when we use this retrograde drill or flip cutter it uh, hits the metal guide and prevents uh, disruption of the cortex and this is what a really a helpful tool that allows us to make these sockets. So as you can see on the bottom diagram E, we're hammering in that guide. And this is a unique drill called a flip cutter. It, it goes in like a guide wire, then it flips and you drill back toward the guide and that's how you make the socket. And, it, and once you've used it once or twice, it's a pretty easy device to use. Actually, one of the things we found by, by using this, this uh, incision is you actually can feel the growth plate. You can feel the concave epiphysis of the tibia and the flatter metaphysis and the growth plate. So this really helps us uh, for our placement of our tibial growth plate. Again, we had to modify the guides to allow much sleep, uh, steeper angles, usually between 30 and 40 degrees. Um, we also modified the guide so that the guide wire doesn't go for the tip of the guide. It actually goes inside the tip because to avoid pass pointing. It's following similar steps, confirm x-ray, place the flip cutter in the knee, flip the flip cutter, and do retrograde drilling, performing a socket. So once we have our sockets passed, we can then bring the... Uh, um, sutures and the suturing buttons into the knee and uh, flip them on the femur, begin to tighten, and then do final tightening and cycling uh, um, and adjust the fixation on the tibia. So here's an MRI of one of our uh, young patients, uh, 10 to 11 year old who uh, had an MRI at six months, and you can see these sockets are really, really close to the growth plates uh, here on the femur. Here's another view of an 11 year old. Uh, here's a different patient, 11 year old boy. You can see the nice uh, tendon within the epiphysis. Here's how our typical x ray would look. It's a 10 year old boy, again with the uh, femoral and tibial fixation. Here's the MRI of that same child, three consecutive sagittal slices. This is to focus your eye on the tibial socket. You see how it's really, really, how the socket just stops close to the uh, growth plate. And let's see if I can get this to run. This will, that's okay. So, uh, so again, we're using our, uh, just, and, and these Arthrex small angle guides are available. So uh, on a, all of our patients, uh, because we think it's difficult to assess uh, the de possibility of growth disturbance on a plain x-ray, we're, we're in New York, we will get post-op MRIs on all of our children. And then our imaging team has, um, this nice uh, nice programs to give us a percentage if there's any growth plate uh, violation. And um, we found in our first 25 patients at the tibial socket, um, the patients who were all epiphyseal, there was less than 2% of physeal compromise. And on the femoral socket, less than, uh, again, less than 2% of physeal compromise. And in follow-up, we have... Uh, yet to see any significant uh, case of growth disturbance. Looking at some of our recent data of our of 38 patients who uh, have had now follow-up of, of, uh, of now approaching two years. Uh, most of these kids were in New York either playing soccer or lacrosse, but there was a football and skiing. Um, their post-operative uh, clinical scores at a year were, were all excellent. Uh, we had no they all had post-operative MRIs at a year, and there was no case of MRI growth disturbance, fracture, articular surface violation, or avascular necrosis. There's also, we all have standing x-rays at a year, and there's no angular deformities. We did have uh, two of our first 38 have had re-tears at 11 and 12 months, and, both, and uh, one patient had a contralateral ACL tear. So we think this is an effective approach uh, for very young kids in uh, our community or young athletes, that is, are having ACL tears in the pediatric population. So thank you very much. 
I had one other case I wanted to show you since this is an implant mediated guided growth um, uh, topic is I wanted to give one case about patella dislocation. I don't think we have time to do the full lecture, but uh, hmm? it's just one case. Okay. It's just one case. Uh, so um, this is a child uh, who presented at age 13 with an unknown diagnosis, but it's a type of congenital proximal tibia dysplasia. Always, as far as the family could remember, had a complete fixed patella dislocation and increasing valgus deformity. So in 2011, we placed the hinge plates. Um, and then uh, after uh, improvement of the valgus, we, had, we did some uh, three-dimensional studies with a CAT scan and MRIs. And here's the child just before um, plate removal. And you can see the complete dislocation, fixed dislocation of the patella. Here's the MRI study after the plate was removed. Um, this patient had a quadricep lag, weakness, and here we are after we took the plates out. You can see um, significant improvement of the valgus. He, we didn't, after, once the summer came and the child was out of school, we did the, the knee reconstruction. So we did a tibial tubercle osteotomy for the large Q angle, a MPFL reconstruction, lateral release, quadricep lengthening, and here he is on his first post-op. It's just recent follow-up um, just last month. So that's how another example of how we can use implant-mediated guided growth in a sequential manner to help with the knee reconstruction. So thank you very much for your time.